Hello and welcome to the special CNBC Africa broadcast. I'm Nozi Pumbanjwa. We're coming to you live from the MasterCard Foundation Symposium on Financial Inclusion here in Kigali, Rwanda. Now, over the next hour, my panelists will explore how by deploying data, we're able to surface behavioral insights that might help financial service providers to better understand and to better service low-income customers. We're also going to get the panelists to reflect and share some of their key lessons on some of the brown, groundbreaking work that we've heard from Dr. Alda Shafir, who's contributed extensively to behavioral sciences and in particular, how they shape and influence how consumers in income constrained con uh, conditions make their financial service conditions and decisions. We're going to be having that conversation in a moment. But for those of you are, who are joining us on social media platforms, the hashtag to participate in the conversation is SOFI2016. That is SOFI2016. We also have a live audience here in Kigali, Rwanda, and they will be bringing their voices and their insights to the conversation through a facilitated question and answer session after the break. For now, though, let's meet our panelists. It's with great pleasure that we are joined by Herman Smith. Herman is a technical director at Centfree. We're also joined by Rose Goslinger. She is a co-founder and director at Bula Advisors. And of course, we're joined by Paul Koehira, who is a senior strategy manager at Kenya Commercial Bank. It's a, such a pleasure to have you all here on the panel today. And perhaps, Herman, let's start off the conversation with a reflection on what, are, what resonates with you from the work of Dr. Alda Schaffer, in particular as we talk about deploying data to better understand low-income consumers? Mm. I think what I particularly appreciated was the emphasis on understanding the context uh, that individuals, and specifically low-income individuals, make financial decision. And that very small uh, drivers or very small changes within that context uh, can uh, help them uh, make their decisions, and specifically their financial decisions, which is often very complicated. So a, a big emphasis on context is mm. this is where the resonance has come from, Rose? I would say coming from an insurance angle, I'm, I was fascinated what we were saying about differences and small differences in like opt-in and opt-out processes. Mm. Mm. You know, it's, it's interesting to hear that within like a big, like a sensitive topic as in like organ donation. But I would say in insurance, we've seen so much of that as well. Like if you change a small piece in your process to make it an opt-out rather than an opt-in, you can really make such a difference and you can really see your numbers surge mm. because of something like that. So then again, uh, going back to those benign, almost benign uh, modifications with mm. that can have a fundamental impact. Paul, uh, what do you take away uh, from the work of Dr. Alda Shafir? Yeah, my two key takeaways were the concept of scarcity, especially when designing products at the bottom of the pyramid. So how do you design the product such that it meets that customer who is scarce or who, has, who is experiencing scarcity from his financial situation? Mm. So how will you design these products? How will you deliver them? And of course, the other one is on the on the whole concept of the opt-in and opt-out, and especially in design of the insurance services. Mm. So do we design insurance services with an opt-out or an opt-in? So that was interesting insight from me as well. I can see Rose is already gearing up for that question, but we will interrogate the extent to which KCB perhaps has begun integrating behavioral uh, insights into their own operational approaches. But Herman, let's maybe just come back to just the universe of data. I mean, for us to begin to even have a conversation about deploying data, there has to be data available. Mm. What does that universe look like? And perhaps as an extension of that, we've also begun talking about alternative sources of data. Mm. What exactly are we talking about and do we have examples of where these alternative sources of data have been effective in terms of allowing uh, low-income customers to be served better? Okay. I think universe is a, uh, an appropriate analogy because um, I think as the universe is expanding so are the sources of data that we have available uh, to inform financial decisions. Um, and uh, this, it's not only that uh, we have new sources of data, so as you say, alternative data, but uh, advancements in uh, computing and data science allows us to make sense of data which we haven't been able to make sense of in the past, uh, as well as process uh, this new data. Um, 
Alternative data doesn't really have a definition, um, but uh, the name does suggest that it has to be something which is not traditional. <laughs> um, and um, my team, uh, or specifically the uh, Insights to Impact team, um, uh, scoured the earth for the 42 most innovative uh, financial services providers and fintech companies that they could find. Um, I'm, they still haven't let me in into uh, what uh, innovative um, uh, was defined as, but I think uh, the location of uh, these entities did have a big play. In, uh, with it that uh, they selected, um, and uh, Tanzania, um, uh, Nairobi, but then also uh, activities happening um, uh, on both the east and uh, the west coast of the US, where they, we see a lot of advances uh, in the use of financial service, or uh, data to inform financial services decision. Um, and the uh, data which um, came across um, most strongly, which people are toying with at the moment to see exactly how they can change the way that we design financial services um, uh, and understand the context in which um, uh, the individuals that need to use these financial services are, um, uh, relates to social media data. I think uh, that's uh, really one which a lot of institutions are looking at uh, to understand. Uh, the other is psychometric data. So we've seen uh, really interesting advances in um, collecting uh, psychometric uh, data on um, uh, customers to help us understand um, what their um, motivations and intentions are to repay loans, for example. <laughs> I'm going to take that answer and I'm actually going to loop it through to Paul and I'll okay. come back to Rose in a second because I think what Herman is, is saying is that although we are talking about alternative sources of data, it assumes that these are just innovative approach to use, approaches to using data. But you have a practical experience of having to use traditional data, which would be transactional data, yeah. and on top of that, perhaps layering uh, data that gives you behavioral insights. This isn't common practice within the banking space. So how does this get integrated into the normal order of doing business, and what kind of value does it unlock for you as a business? Okay, uh, thank you, Nasifo. Uh, one of the, for us, we are looking at both financial and financial data in terms of whether transactional or behavioral, to be able to make decisions uh, financial decisions for our customers. So we are looking at both internal data, whatever we've been able to gather of our customers over time, and also external. So using partners, strategic partnerships, uh, like through telcos and pharma producer organizations, we are beginning to learn uh, to, and to get insights mm -hmm. about people's behavior, and that helps us make the financial decisions necessary to provide them financial services. And of course, uh, we could extend this to uh, other parts of the business like credit scoring uh, yes. models and those two can be influenced. And I suspect we'll get back to those, but one of the challenges I think Paul put right at your feet in his opening comments, uh, Rose, is to really begin to talk to, talk to us about the insurance space uh, in particular. And this is where we, you know, we have real perception barriers and risk perceptions that, uh, that are rooted in, in, in internal and in inherent biases. So maybe let's get an understanding from you how through your experience over the years where you have worked with index insurance, you've been able to tap into data that gives you behavioral insights to better understand low income customers. Well, thanks for that. I think the, well, one of when we started working on insurance, I think we started from a concept that was to some extent very noble. We thought mm. that, you know, farmers wanted insurance. Probably we came from a perspective that we thought that they needed insurance, but we learned very quickly that want and need was very different. Yeah. Um, and I'd say, like for example, in our first season, we'd set a uh, we'd set up a modest target. We wanted to reach about 500 farmers sign up for our insurance, and I would say we had an intense marketing campaign. We used radio advertisements, brochures, and we had 105, 185 people sign up. We trained 1,000 people, but only 185 signed up. And when we looked carefully about what was driving this, you know, we, like, you see things of, you know, we always put, do these presentations where we have lots of smiling farmers, but when you talk about insurance, I'll tell you, they're not smiling. They're looking at you with kind of like, I don't trust insurance companies. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you know they've, why would I buy insurance now I've managed all these years? You know, why would I, you know? Even if the ones that we're buying or that we're willing to buy, they think, let me let somebody else try this out first. Mm -hmm. Next year, if it works, if they keep their promise, I'll come and buy this kind of product. So you really have to you know, think about how your process works. And I would say in terms of you know, how data has supported what we're doing, I'd say as much as on the behavioral side, it also really helped enable these kind of products. And I'd like to loop in uh, to what Herman was saying. You know, we've, when I started working, one of my first insurance projects was actually here in Rwanda. And, um, 
we started using something called weather index insurance, which uses weather stations to monitor for things like droughts. Now, the only weather station that was actually operational that we could use in the whole of Rwanda was the one around at the airport. Mm. And I'll tell you, like, airports are not the place where farmers congregate around. <laughs> um, so we very quickly had to kind of find other kind of sources of data. So, and satellite information, that's why I loved Herman's comment, you know, you look at the universe. Like, we literally have to look at the universe. Look at satellite data. Satellite data has been a hugely important source for ensuring for drought, for example. Um, but it also comes with the downsides. In the beginning, you know, we, we, underst we were very enthusiastic. We wanted to ensure for drought, for storms, all these kind of things. Um, and then I, but I'll never forget, we sat across from this farmer and he's lost his, you know, he's lost his crop due to a storm. But our satellite was telling us that, you know, his, his field was fine. He's gotten lots of rain, but, you know, his field were fine. And we're talking to this farmer and this farmer, and I'm explaining the calculation, which is you know, a bit complex already, but he was mm. getting it. And in the end, he says to me, you bring this Mr. Satellite, you show him my farm, and then we discuss. <laughs> and then you realize, you know, you, you can put out all this technology, and we're so excited about all this technology, but yeah. we have to really kind of make sure that we keep the ground realities. Mm. And so we had really had to change our products to serve that kind of stuff. I think that's a fantastic uh, analogy and a story that you've shared with us. And Herman, I want to bring it back to whether we, we are in a position where we can confidently articulate and quantify the benefits that deploying data for behavioral insights has had for customers in particular. Are there those case studies that we can point to as best practice even in an African context? Mm. So uh, I think on aggregate the answer is definitely no. Um, I think we're still um, uh, experimenting and uh, using what is coming out of behavioral science, which is also an evolving field at the moment, um, and looking from behavioral science and from this data that we have, how we can better understand uh, these contextual factors. But um, every data, uh, as the traditional data that we have, has it pros and cons. And as we test it in different um, uh, contexts and in, for different use cases and for different products, insurance is very different to credit, um, which is different to payments and savings, um, and uh, even the uses of these products. So using insurance for healthcare versus using insurance for agricultural risk, mm. these are very different contexts in which people make these decisions. So as we look at this data to help us understand how we can um, uh, better create these products, um, uh, we will learn uh, where the shortcomings are. Um, I think we've definitely seen the biggest advancements uh, in uh, credit scoring. Right. And I think we have a great example here, um, uh, for KCB and PESA, which uh, Paul will talk about. Um, but uh, we also see other examples uh, where um, uh, you can download applications and they extract 2,000 variables from your phone. Um, uh, one of these examples is Branch, which mm. operates in uh, Kenya and Tanzania. And from uh, the number of people that you have in your contact list, um, how many contacts have a first and a last name, mm. um, how, which of your messages you have read or responded to. This type of behavioral data which uh, we exhibit on our phone really helps uh, this company specifically mm. uh, to generate risk scoring models uh, to provide credit to mm. people who were previously not um, in credit bureaus. Um, yeah. That's a fantastic insight, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to send it straight through to Paul because I think the uh, the Impesa example is one that I think we're all familiar with in the room. Uh, perhaps one of the fastest growing financial products on the continent. But let's bring in the layer of of be, uh, behavioral science data in particular, and whether they are emerging insights that without behavioral science data we wouldn't have known. And what are these insights? Are there interesting pieces of behavior that are coming through? Oh yes, thank you. Um, to begin with, we'll just start talking about uh, KCB and PESA. It's a mm. service between KCB, the largest bank in Eastern Africa, and Safaricom, the largest mobile network operator. So it provides mobile financial service, it provides credit and savings on the mobile. So in the last 18 months since the launch, the product has been able to reach 7.1 million customers. So out of this, so the insights that are coming from this is that uh, one, over three million of these customers are actually active on a monthly basis. And out of those, some of them even up to three times a month. Yeah, so, and a lot of the transactions that are taking place are for their everyday use. People borrow uh, for food, for transport, and also uh, we are beginning to see that they could be actually trading with it. So we are seeing the importance of them, of, of using data, m data, to be able to facilitate small micro-enterprises mm. to capitalize their businesses. 
Yep. So if we were to extend that a bit uh, more, Paul, I mean, these are really interesting insights, but how do they then change the approach going into the future? Because at the end of the day, we need to start thinking about how do we better design and better deliver uh, for low-income co uh, uh, consumers. So with these new insights that have come through, how is KCB perhaps now thinking about refining and tweaking uh, the model so that we see greater penetration and value for clients? Okay, the way we are looking at it is that uh, we are at the beginning. We've been able to scale to large numbers, but we are also cognizant of the fact that we need to continue learning from this data mm. and from how our customers are behaving on the service. So building empirical models in terms of how are they repaying, how long do you stay out with a loan, do the nudges, do the reminders mm. for repayment have an impact on the performance of the product? So that's what we are looking at in future. Rose, one of the things that I think we touched on earlier and, and, and uh, in an off-site conversation and that I really hope could come through as well is how we have seen behavioral science data actually enabling uh, financial service providers to change the actual relationship uh, that consumers have with those, uh, with those providers. Your insights there. Well, I think one of, the, one of the things that fascinates me about KCB and PESA is that you know, it's really changed how we... Um, it's, it's really nano microfinance, but it's really changing how microfinance works. Because microfinance, we were all ha working about group pressure. But one of the attractive things that I'm seeing with KCP and PESA is that people no longer have to put on a suit, the very nice suit that Herman and Paul are wearing, to go into a bank. They, and there's so much, like, and one of the things that we realized, Paul and I did a project together supported by Alliance for Green Revolution Africa, and one of the things that came out very strongly in our marketing messages that came out of the discussions was that people you know, we actually emphasized that it was somehow a bit private, that people no longer were going to need to have their, you know, to have their neighbors know that they were taking out a loan. There was no that societal pressure of, you know, you have to make sure that you're in the good books of the branch manager, because otherwise you're not going to get a loan. And I think that really changes, like, how these kind of products are going to run. We're seeing, you know, how people are, like, what time they're taking up loans, how, you know, what, what volumes, you know. I remember one of... Paul's colleagues at some point in a meeting sitting and saying, explaining how last night he took up a KCB and PESA loan because his credit card, there was no ATM that was working and you know, he needed his card broken down. You know, there's, there's very everyday needs that these kind of products are addressing and that in, particularly in these, kind of, in these developing economies where credit is such a driver can be so important. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah, so maybe yeah. I can add to what Rose is saying and uh, very true. And what, what, one of the things that uh, mobile, the mobile financial service and using data is doing, is bringing dignity mm. to the consumer. Mm. Yeah, so that you have a need, a very special need, you don't need to borrow or ask your group to come in for you. Mm. So mm. by accessing your bank on phone and getting that timely credit actually introduces dignity to a lot of people on the bottom of the program. That's a fantastic insight given the, the, the fundamentals around how microfinance uh, approaches are built. Again, moving from sort of group accountability to self-dignity, uh, if you will. But I, I, I suspect we also run the risk of having a very high-level conversation, Herman, that doesn't always reflect the reality on the ground. And I would assume that even while we're dealing with emerging insights uh, from behavioral science data, that there are also emerging challenges that make it increasingly difficult to tap into and to harness uh, uh, data and alternative sources of data for behavioral insights. Have we begun to think about what those uh, uh, challenges are? And in particular, how do we begin to mitigate so that we can move forward? Mm. So I think a lot of people spend uh, time both thinking and experiencing the challenges of uh, using alternative or behavioral data. And I think um, uh, in the corridors over the next two days, uh, many financial services providers uh, will um, uh, share that experience. Um, and I think the, the first is just that with any new um, uh, innovation, let's put it like that, uh, there's always an adaption or a, a process uh, with adoption. Uh, and uh, this is challenging from an institutional perspective, um, but it's also because the, on the other side of um, the investment uh, in the human capital and the physical capital uh, to um, make uh, sense of this data, is a lot of unknowns. Um, we don't know what the business case is for many of these data sources. We don't know whether or not um, uh, they 
uh, are only uh, good proxies within the periods which we've been using them to date, uh, and whether or not they will hold up to um, other macro changes uh, which also affect uh, the markets in which we operate in. So there's a lot of uncertainty, but there's also a lot of really good examples of where financial services providers were able to provide financial services which wouldn't have been possible without it. Mm. So credit scoring is a really good example of this, and I think this is where mm. alternative data and specifically the use of um, a call detailed records, which is mm. a type of data, um, uh, has been the most successful. We're talking about tens of millions of people who now have access uh, to credit um, and small amounts of credit, mm. which they wouldn't have been able to if we were using traditional um, uh, business models uh, to deliver that credit. Allow me to be a bit difficult. I yes. mean, if we, if we move from the assumption mm. that um, perhaps exploiting buyers has mm. traditionally always uh, led yes. to enhanced profits. Mm. How do we then incentivize financial service providers to go for the de-bias, mm. behaviorally informed approach, and to invest in mm. doing business in that way? Yes, I think first we need to de-bias ourselves. So if we are going to discount future profits for profits today as firms, if we're mm. not going to look at the customer lifetime value, if we're not going to look at how can this financial services relationship between um, uh, the institution and the client be profitable over the long term, uh, then as institutions we're always going to be motivated to think short term. But as soon as we think longer term, um, we're able to um, uh, design products which are in the long term benefit uh, mm. of our customers. So I think this is uh, de-biasing mostly of the institutions um, right. and we can use behavioral science to do that and data. <laughs> and I'll come back to um, regulations because the regulatory environment then just becomes a very big talking mm. point here. But before we get to that, I want to stay on the concept of, of design, Rose, and I want, to, uh, I want us to perhaps start to think about whether data can play a role mm -hmm. in building um, des or designing products that have a very strong reiterative feedback loop um, as one of the ways of creating the long-term value that Herman speaks about. Definitely. Look, I think if you're, uh, as a small business person, um, you know, you can't, I think you can't afford, like if, maybe if you're a bigger organization, you can afford not to be iterative. Mm -hmm. But if you run a small business, you have to be iterative. Like at the moment, we run a product in Malawi that, you know, um, where farmers don't actually have to purchase insurance, but it's packaged into a bag of seed. And the only thing they need to do is actually register. Um, now in the beginning, like, so our main focus in, over the season is making sure that people register and putting out, trying out different methods to make sure that they do that. Um, and so they started this radio advert somewhere over the weekend. And our, uh, our response to the, we thought, well, maybe the response to the radio advert is people are going to buy. The response to the radio advert was not people are going to buy. People were testing out, does this thing really work? Mm -hmm. So they started in like mass texting like our short code. And we were like, wait, our short code is saying that if they just text us that it's, you know, enter a shop code and a pin code, but they're, they're don't, they don't get what they need to do about that. So we quickly had to change kind of the process saying, okay, so if you're texting us and, you haven't, and you're texting us straight after a radio advert, mm. we have to send you a message saying, hey, go to the shop, buy a bag of seed, and it's going to come with insurance. So you really have to, like, I think in these kind of products, when you're looking at these, um, with these kind of products, you have to be very, you have to listen to your customer all the time. Mm. There is no day that you can kind of take off. And of course, having that antenna, Paul, uh, facing in the right direction and picking up the right sounds off the ground from the consumers yeah. also means that there's going to be a certain degree of rethinking what the internal processes and the internal systems, even within a, a, a bank, have to look like to allow for those reiterative processes and to allow for the integration of behavioral science data. What is that journey currently like? And, uh, and, and if KCB is undergoing it, What's been the one thing that's uh, given you the biggest headache to date? Well, <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting. This is, um, there are a lot of changes that have taken place, and especially in use of data to provide services. So one of the things that is changing is actually investing in these credit scoring engines. A lot of investment needs to go in there. A lot of training of the staff from the statisticians and uh, the internal credit staff in terms of using the data and actually accepting it. That's a big challenge, so an investment is required in that space. And the other thing is also in terms of just uh, looking for those alternative sources of data. Yeah? And agreeing that internally you can actually look out, mm. use what you have internally, and look out even to partners um, who can be able to assist you provide this data. So for example, 
uh, KCB on the agriculture space is working with the MasterCard Foundation on a recently launched uh, partnership to deliver mobile financial services, that is credit, insurance, and payments, to farmers. So how we've begun doing it is that uh, we've started gathering data from external uh, service providers, from farmer producer organizations, to just learn about the farm and how this particular farmer delivers his produce to the farm, see how consistent that is to what amounts, and hence make the right uh, credit decisions. And also, also design the product that fits into that farmer's needs. And just before we go to break, a quick one for me, Rose, and I think it links uh, quite well with uh, what uh, uh, Paul is, uh, is sharing in terms of the environment within, the, 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 the complexity of the environment that we have to take into consideration. But on the other hand, we always talk about financial literacy of the consumers. Is there a role for uh, behavioral science data uh, to play here so that we can amp the effectiveness of financial literacy? Sure, um, there, there's definitely a role for financial literacy, but I think one of the things that I'd want to tap onto what Paul was saying, because me and Paul ran this project, or have been running this project together, and one of the things that I've been so impressed about is, you know, whatever technical challenges there might be, alone, particularly in these markets, particularly in the rural markets, is such a big carrot. Mm. And it really, look, so in the beginning, like I remember we had our first soft launch, and we had tons of things that would give both of us proper headaches. Mm. but. At the, like when we had this, we had this meeting and it was scorchingly hot and for the whole morning these farmers sat there and at the end of it we had all these technical difficulties and they were having some tea while we were trying to sort them and these two ladies came up to me and Paul and said, you know, you're not leaving here before we get a loan. And we saw these people working through like, you know, the USSD menus and any kind of, you know, user-centric design would tell us, you know, they're, they're going to get lost, but they're so keen on mm. getting that loan. It's such a big carrot. Um, so they would find their way. They wouldn't get lost. And I, I think from a financial literacy perspective, you know, we also shouldn't underestimate our customers. We should, you know, I've had pastoralists in rural Ethiopia tell me that, you know, insurance companies have lots of small print and you should watch out. You know, so really, like, I think there's, we have to make sure that things are not too complex, but we should also shouldn't underestimate our customers. And on that note, we have to make sure that things are not too complex, but balancing that with keeping them as simple as possible. We're going to take a short ad break. When we come back, we continue our conversation. And of course, we hear from our live audience here in Kigali, Rwanda, what are their questions, their voices, and their insights on this MasterCard Foundation Symposium? I'll see you in two minutes. Welcome back to the MasterCard Foundation Symposium on Financial Inclusion, coming to you live from Kigali, Rwanda. In the first half of the show, we've had a robust conversation on how deploying data that might surface behavioral insights can be harnessed by financial service providers to better understand and better service their low-income customers. We have a live audience here in Kigali, and we have invited them to contribute to the conversation through a facilitated question and answer session. We're going to turn to that session now and get their voices and their insights into the broader dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your participation. Let's take our first question. May I kindly ask you to stand and introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Ivan Morenzi. I work with a company in Rwanda called Access to Finance Rwanda. We support financial institutions to extend financial services. Interesting discussion. My question is to Paul. Um, you talked of the investment that is needed in, in making data accessible and useful. And I was just wondering the role of third party providers like uh, fintech companies. Can you tell us more on that? Have you had any experience with that? Especially speaking for small microfinance institutions that may not have that much investment. Is there an opportunity to work with third party providers? Thank you. Ivan, thank you so much for that question. Let's take our second question uh, from the audience. Uh, and get uh, that, uh, that question through. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, my name is John Magney. I'm the head of agriculture for Opportunity International. Uh, my question is also to Paul. Um, Paul, I think you've set yourself a very large challenge in terms of the number of farmers which you're hoping to reach. Do you believe it's possible to, uh, to gather all of the data uh, remotely, digitally, or, or how much uh, uh, physical engagement do you think you need with the, uh, with the farmers to identify their, their complex needs uh, for agriculture? John, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic question. Let's take a third question for this round. Uh, Madam, please do go ahead. 
Hi, I'm Larato Lohoko from Yellowwoods Ventures and Investments in South Africa. My question is to Herman. I'm quite excited about the potential that using data to serve lower income customers has. My observation is that it seems to be in tension with legislation around the protection of personal information. So I'd like to understand whether, to what extent that observation is true, what's been your experience around the world, and how can providers get around that tension if it exists? Lerato, thank you so much. Uh, Paul, let me give you an opportunity to perhaps uh, take a peek at the questions, uh, given that two of them are at, uh, were tabled for you. Ivan's question in particular looks at uh, the investment that we say is required, and he puts this in the context of small and medium-sized enterprises, of course, that might not have as big an uh, investment muscle as a KCB. Okay, uh, thank you very much from, uh, the, for that question about the investment. And I think it, uh, with regard to investment in the right technology, in the right uh, credit scoring engines, I think both the big and the smaller organizations have to make the decision. And what we find is that there are examples of fintech companies out there, some of them we are working with, that are able to provide these services uh, to financial institutions, both big and small. So for, even for a microfinance institution, there are fintechs that are already beginning to build their models gathering data out there, uh, building uh, even the mobile engines, even the mobile interfaces to enable uh, financial institutions to provide the service. So you don't have to invest it yourself. Even big institutions such as KCB are also using partners in addition to our internal teams. Rose, I wonder if you might want to, to add to, to sure. that. In the project that we did together with Paul and KCB, one of the most, I think, most practical like, solutions or things that we used was uh, data from dairy cooperatives. We found that increasing the amount of dairy cooperatives in Kenya was starting to use um, MIS systems to record daily milk intake. Um, now, we basically went and I think we scoured around 30 dairies or something that would represent around 65,000 farmers and we're getting like, about three years of daily milk records. Yeah. Now, like, if you were a smaller microfinance institution, you tar targeted dairy cooperatives as, as like, a good target, particularly if in a country like Rwanda where you know, dairy cows are such a big thing. Like, if I was working in Rwanda, I'd go and find those different dairy co-ops, get the data, and from the data, you actually, it's just like seeing somebody's salary, mm -hmm. and, you know, but it's coming from a different source. So I think for these kind of things, you don't have to be big or small, but you have to be creative mm -hmm. to look and find and think about where you can get the data from that could estimate what you'd otherwise use with traditional credit scoring models. So it's, it's a question of uh, innovation and yeah. creativity and not always just a question of, about cost. I'm going to come to the second question, but uh, Herman, let's take Lerato's question. Um, and, and this is where she's seeing a, a bit of a conundrum or a, a contradiction where we're talking about data, but also there's legislation that seems to suggest that we need to uphold the protection of, 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 of private information. So how do we actually hit that balance? Mm. So this is a very important question, and I think um, uh, there's a lot of tension um, in data analytics firms, new fintech ventures, but specifically financial services providers who are starting to build business models around the use of certain client data uh, without any clear understanding of how the regulation will evolve um, uh, in future. So will these models or credit scoring models still be um, uh, possible within the regulatory environment of the countries in which they operate in a year or two's time from now? Should we invest in the analytic uh, um, ability? Should we invest in collecting that data, which is huge cost, um, if we're only able to do or use it for uh, one or two years? I think regulators have a particularly difficult challenge here um, uh, because because we don't yet understand what the ultimate benefit to the client can be from using this data, we don't know what we're trading off. So on the one hand, we have the protection of customers' data, which is um, uh, very important to consider. But on the other side, we have the benefit uh, that these customers can derive from institutions understanding the context in which they make financial services decisions better. Um, so this trade-off can only really happen once we fully understand or, or better understand um, where the use cases are evolving for that yeah. data. We're currently helping governments uh, think through this. Uh, so the um, uh, Insights to Impact team is working with the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, who has a sub-working group, which is um, convening, I think, around 160 governments or so yeah. uh, around this topic of client protection and financial inclusion. We see tens of millions of people getting access to credit because of the use of 
of this data. We know that uh, the World Bank says that only 7% of people in Africa um, are recorded in any way uh, mm. in um, a credit bureau. Um, so this, this data has the potential to really change the market. Um, so we need to trade that off uh, against the protection of individuals. So in pursuit of uh, a middle ground, mm. and, and that work is still ongoing. Uh, Paul, the second question that was uh, put to you, and that came from John, uh, was in particular looking at the process of gathering the data, uh, and in particular matching that against the ambitions in terms of the number of farmers that a player like KCB wishes to reach. What are the, 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 the approaches? Is it digital? Is it remote? Um, is it physical contact? And perhaps as an extension of that, what are the trade-offs uh, uh, that are at play when you choose uh, between approaches? Okay, uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, <clears throat> what we see is, in terms of being able to reach the numbers that we're talking about, there's a clear case for using mobile and digital to be able to scale up and reach millions of people. So what we're seeing today is that, uh, for example, in the dairy subsector alone, there are over a million farmers in Kenya who are already in that sector. A lot of them are in the cooperatives. So a lot of data has actually been built. So what we are looking at is a journey. We are saying there are still challenges. A lot of the agriculture, for example, these are focused on agriculture. So a lot of these organizations that are dealing with agriculture, a lot of farmers are actually trading in cash. And that information is not yet available in the financial ecosystem. However, we are also seeing a lot of organizations like the dairies that I just mentioned and what Rose, just relating to what Rose mentioned, is that a lot of these dairy cooperatives and a lot of dairy organizations are actually gathering the data. Mm. Some of the challenges include that um, the data may not be in the format that may be readily usable for the financial institutions, so it's for us to begin helping them. And hence the reason for some of these interventions like the one between KCB and the MasterCard Foundation mm. to help with that. We understand it's a journey. But we also appreciate that there's also additional data that has been built on the mobile financial system. For example, through M-Pesa, with their close to 20 million customers and just 7.1 million customers available in KCB M-Pesa only, it shows you that you can, actually, uh, you can actually scale up. It's for us to be ambitious to be able to reach the millions of people who don't have access to financial services. So scale is definitely an option. I think we'll go back to the audience and uh, take some more questions. Uh, can I have an indication of where the next question is coming from? Madam, please go ahead. Thank you very much. So good morning. My name is Vicky Escaro. I'm uh, the CEO of Opportunity International. And my question is for the panel. Uh, we've recently entered into uh, a partnership with a fintech organization called MyBucks. And we're be beginning to utilize artificial intelligence to determine if clients are the right clients uh, for us to serve and how to serve them better. So my question to the three of you is, are you employing a similar approach to utilizing data in that fashion? Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. Uh, let's take another question from the floor. Madam, please go ahead. Uh, or let's take the Madam at the back. There's a microphone there, and then we'll come back to you in the front. Please go ahead. I'm Gloria Frimpong, Melecom Ghana Limited, MNO operators of Tigo. My question goes to Paul and Herman. I want to understand how we can use predictive modeling as a big data tool to grow usage of insurance and then mobile financial services and also increase penetration. Thank you very much, uh, Gloria. Fantastic question. And I suspect that one that Rose will also take a stab at. Let's take our final question. Madam, please go ahead. My name is Jen Ferreria from Group CEO Kenya Women Holding and Kenya Women Microfinance Bank. My question goes to everyone on the podium. I've not had you mention the importance of collecting data from a gender perspective and analysis and use. Could you comment on that? Thank you very much. That's the gender perspective. Uh, thank you very much for that, Jen. I think uh, we've got uh, our hands full with uh, a lot of these insightful uh, questions. Maybe let me start off with the questions that, are, that, that have been direct. Uh, the question that has come from Gloria for both uh, Paul and Herman, um, the potential to use predictive uh, modeling to drive penetration and the uptake uh, of, uh, for example, insurance services. Herman? So I think... Um, uh, we spoke earlier about um, uh, all of these different data sources, and uh, IBM came out with a study this uh, year which estimates that 90% of the data which is digitally recorded at the moment has been collected in the last two years. 
So that just shows the amount or mass of information that we have to deal with. Um, artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, or um, other um, uh, data analytic techniques allow us to make sense of a large mass of information which we currently either do not have the theory to make sense of. So in other words, behavioral science hasn't gone far enough to help us understand the causative relationship between different variables. Um, uh, or it helps us to uh, um, take that theory which we understand to um, bring in all of these different data sources. Um, it's also very useful uh, as a tool to clean data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, as I said, like this large quantity of data using um, uh, these algorithms to clean mm -hmm. uh, that data and make it available in a useful format uh, for you to mm -hmm. um, segment and understand. So just before I go, I go to Paul, perhaps you could also then by extension address the point that uh, Vicky has raised and this is around uh, whether you know, they are using uh, artificial intelligence to drive their client selection strategies. Mm. Uh, where, ha where else have we seen that um, and has it proven effective? Mm. So, um, understanding or making sense of your engagement with your customers to date, which I'm assuming is where they would start. So, um, they have uh, various uh, data um, uh, on their clients and their engagement with their clients to date, uh, which uh, other um, analytic techniques um, uh, might not be able to trawl through and make sense of um, uh, to the same level of um, effectiveness. Um, so I think in, in that case, learning what has made a good customer, what type of engagement has um, uh, assisted customers in the repayment journey, um, mm. uh, what type of factors um, make individuals more likely to benefit from that loan and ultimately be able to repay. I think these are all important things to understand, um, especially mission-driven organizations mm. who are extending credit um, beyond um, uh, just extending the number of financial services, but really want to have impact with that, right. understanding un in, under which conditions and which variables are good proxies for that, this will truly benefit the customers. Um, outstanding work, good job. For us, the way we are looking at it is that uh, beginning with the services that we've already started providing that are using data, for example, the KCB M-Pesa, what we are using is we are using empirical models to begin building our knowledge and insights about these customers who have already opted into the service and how they're using it. So we are looking at your repayment behavior, how uh, you respond to nudges, for example, when it comes to reminders for your repayment, how you're doing with regard to your timely payment or earlier payment, how often you're borrowing, to be able to decide whether to increase your limit and to what extent. Yeah, so those are some of the ways we are using uh, learning to be able to improve our product. And, and, and I think you can also, by extension, also just comment on uh, uh, Vicky's uh, question, who again has indicated that they're using uh, AI as, a, as one of the key approaches to um, engaging and choosing the clients with the, which they work. How are we seeing AI manifest itself at an operational level in the bank? Okay, um, we are not yet using AI uh, expressly, um, artificial intelligence in that way, uh, but the way we look at it, that is uh, in the next, uh, within the period of the program which we are running, that we will be improving our credit scoring models to using, in terms of the future, bringing in additional data, bringing in uh, even information from mm -hmm. non-financial sources. Not only do, for example, our target customers participate in more than one income earning stream, you'll find a farmer, he's a dairy farmer and also a tea farmer. Mm. You'll find him that he's already a trader within his local market. You'll find that we're looking at in future, statistics are showing that more and more uptake of smartphones is taking place in Africa, in the region where we are operating. So we are looking at our customers getting more into social media. So we are cognizant of the fact that we'll be bringing in even analytics from social media activity to be able to advise us and, mm. in, and help us improve our insights about our customers. Now, uh, before we all get to Jen's question, um, Rose, um, I, I think you most definitely have uh, some insights and inputs around uh, the questions raised by both Vicky and Gloria. I think in particular with regard to what Vicky was saying, I think AI is, is going to have a very important role to play because the traditional sources that we're using so far um, will really help target the urban customers, but that market is going to become very competitive very quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like 
a lot of the urban customers, yes, they have smartphones and there's a lot of data that you can scrape through like technology like the branch is using. But like I think particularly call data records, earlier this year there was a paper in Science magazine that looked at how call data records could actually estimate wealth. And one of the most fascinating findings from that from that article was that they could they could track mobility. And they didn't know what they were looking for, because that was the thing about AI. They're, they're just, they're having the data, they're running it, they're seeing what's kind of come out. And one of the best predictors of income was mobility. And why? Because mobility was likely to predict if somebody owned a motorcycle. Mm. And owning a motorcycle is one of those things that you look at in your traditional household surveys of wealth. You know, we look at, does somebody have a radio? Does somebody have a tin roof? But through call data records, we could see somebody's mobile signal kind of moving around and that actually became a really good indicator so i think those kind of things like the product that we ran together at kcb with paul's team and the support of agro really you know one of the fascinating things i thought about it when we saw look we had about 20 percent of our customers were already taking kcb and pesa um, and when we looked at that customers we were looking we were checking their credit scores against the credit scores we were getting from the alternative data and right. the alternative data actually gave people a much higher credit score because in rural areas people don't transact that much through Mpesa yet mm. so if you can use if you can add other sources of data if you can let alter, um, if you can let alter, like artificial intelligence really if you can let that power get loose on that I think there's a lot of potential and we'll see that market really kind of taking off because of that particularly targeting mm. rural consumers so Herman I'm going to give you the first stab at uh, again uh, looking at the point that Jen has raised and this is uh, specifically looking at uh, gender uh, insights and, and gender analysis from uh, data and 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 I, I suspect from what Rose uh, um, Jen is uh, is raising is knowing that when we look at low income communities, we know to a large extent that women uh, in those low income communities tend to be far uh, worse off in terms of their own socioeconomic standing. So what is the potential uh, for, for us to actually then drill down to gender specific insights and do we have examples where that might be done already? Mm. So I think we, once again, one of the great insights from uh, the previous session is that context matters and context matters a lot in the decisions that we make. And here, um, things such as cultural norms, um, uh, all of these factors are within your context and influence the types of decisions that you make. So we need to be aware of uh, that context mm. and uh, be aware of how that is different for women than it is for men in many cases and uh, tailor um, uh, the intervention or that financial service mm. to match that context. Um, I think that's uh, my main contribution mm. on it. I'm sure others will have uh, Rosa, to say as well. Uh, Rosa, are there interesting insights around how women interface and engage with um, agricultural finance or just uh, insurance products uh, generally? Definitely, like, and particularly with regards to finance and particularly when it comes to mobile, I think with women, you have to, you know, there's generally, there's a well-known bias in terms of mobile usage for women versus men. And so what we've seen in the products that we've done together is that, look, if you want to target women, you will need some further human interaction. There'll be some, they're very willing to use it, but they might need somebody to initially guide them through the process. And if you can put that there, I think, you know, you'll, you'll definitely have actually probably your more loyal customers will come from there. I think the other part is, you know, actually with, when, you're, when you're looking to target women, you really should use alternative data in addition to, let's say, your mobile network operator data because of that bias. Um, so let's say what we're saying about these milk records, those milk records would give women a higher score right. than if we'd only use their mobile phone records. So I think that's, you know, if, we, if you want to make a concerted effort to reach out to women, then you, you need to think very carefully about how you're channeling or how you're marketing. Like with insurance, you know, we found that if we were doing a marketing campaign, we had to like time in the day, we had to time our adverts in a different time of the day if we wanted to reach women because they were likely to be more at home or they would go to the farm at a different point in time. So those kind of things, they're details, but they're extremely important if you want to reach a certain target market. And Paul? Yeah. Um, so based on our field work and what we've done, especially in uh, ag finance on mobile, uh, it's very interesting that uh, just triangulated from where Haman has stopped in terms of the context we realize that in Kenya, uh, several co different communities have different uh, placement of women when it comes to the financial service and when it comes to the agricultural produce. So for example, the Maasai community in Kenya, the cow is actually owned by the man, but the milk is owned by the woman. So for, so for, so for, for us providing uh, dairy products, financial service to dairy farmers in Maasai land, we're looking at more women. 
It's more likely that there'll be more women there. But looking at, for example, in areas like in the North Rift where we've started our pilot, we find that a lot of the registration on the family is actually to the man because it's a patriarchal kind of society. So we find that uh, our view of the woman may not be as close. We may not be seeing the women who are actually delivering the milk to the dairy cooperatives. If you look at areas like in central Kenya, you might find that there's a balance between the woman and the man. So for, probably the person who is registered in the dairy cooperative will be the man, and the woman is allowed to sell the milk in the evening in cash to be able to meet the family's daily expenses. Mm -hmm. So all those nuances and the context of the application of this financial service will be very important when delivering service targeted at women. Mm. And so as we begin to wrap up the conversation, I'd like to invite each uh, uh, of the panelists to perhaps share a thought that you think would allow us to move the conversation forward. Uh, how do you see uh, the use of data that could serve as behavioral, uh, behavioral insights be better used uh, in the financial services space? What would need to change? What would need to be accelerated? And what would need to be stopped? And by whom? And Herman, I start with you. Great. I don't know how much time we have. <laughs> <laughs> Not much. So, so uh, I think if I had to make one recommendation um, of what I would want to see for uh, alternative data um, and behavioral science to make a larger impact in how low-income people experience or the type of financial services that are available to them and how it benefits them is partnerships. Um, we see some of these data sets which we don't know what to do with in isolation, but as soon as they partner, like uh, these data sets come together uh, and give us much more insight about those customers. A number of use cases that are unlocked through data sharing agreements by different parties um, uh, really hold a lot of promise. Um, and then banks, retailers and agricultural value chains, like these individuals aren't actually the best ones to do the data analytics. Mm. Um, so what, what we found to be very useful and is something that we're doing um, in Rwanda now in partnership with the ICT chambers is bringing in data scientists to work with this data. Let's, let's expose them. Let's uh, create incentives for them to play around with this data and see what use cases come out of it. Mm. They're often much more creative than we are. Um, and uh, the, out of these will come very promising uh, applications for this data. Fantastic. So it's partnerships and uh, sweating the assets that yeah. are data scientists yeah. uh, in, in every way possible. Yeah. Rose, uh, as we evolve, what needs to stop, what needs to accelerate, and, and, uh, what, and by whom? Um, well, what needs to stop is definitely you know, asking for physical collateral, because as we are looking for financial services, as I said, like credit is the big pull in for people to start using these services. And as banks or financial institutions still, like I remember when we started different projects that you know, people would still ask for a cow as a collateral. And you know, are you really gonna repossess that cow? It's not gonna work. You know, just like with insurance, we couldn't go and visit every farm. We had to use different types of data. And I think you know, we really had, the, there was a growing, like, like, simply the fact that this conference is here and that the first panel is on data is such a shift. Mm -hmm. you know? So this is, like, data is really gonna be there. And I think one of the other things that I, we were in Ethiopia the other week and somebody made me a wager. Um, to say, okay, well, look, I don't believe that data is there. And I was like, okay, bring it on. I will find the data because it's there. And he bought me dinner. There's no problem. Like, you will, because the data is there. I think the other thing is to really, you know, be creative. It's not going to be in one place. It's going to be in different places. And you're going to have to patch things together and layer different layers of data on top of each other. But if you do that, you can come to really fascinating solutions that can really reach a lot of impact um, and can reach numbers. And I think, yeah. If it can't reach scale, we shouldn't do it. So, is there anything we could do differently uh, to make data more accessible and uh, and 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 allow it to be collated a little bit more easier than it currently is in the African context? I think particularly public resources have a lot of data, and sometimes we come across we we have meetings and they say, well, you know, you need to write a letter before you can get this, or you know, you can't. This data is, you know, I was once uh, told that I was a threat to national security because I wanted to have weather data, or <laughs> it was installing weather stations, and I kid you not, they were very serious. Yeah. And I think those kind of attitudes definitely are not going to unlock these kind of markets because you know then you can't move. Mm. But definitely, I think that is changing. There's much more positive attitudes. The public sector has a big role to play in here because they are they are sitting on, on you know a richness of data mm. that could be used and as they've you know I would say as they've collected it with public money is there a reason why they cannot you know be public about this be public about the data Paul uh, what do we need to start what do we need to stop what do we need to accelerate 
the, the way I look at it is uh, in terms of using data to begin by learning how you're going to design the product. So if you can begin learning about how customers behave, what's the easiest way to help people opt in into your service? Is it self-service? Is it uh, an assisted service? So that's very critical if we can learn about that. So, and for me, the next point is we need to start. There is some data available, there is partnerships that are available, but let's start somewhere. Let's begin and continue learning. Because I think it's a journey. We cannot say that we've now learned human behavior and now can design products. So I think, to me, it's a journey. Yeah. And most importantly, just to reiterate what Haman has said, is the concept and the importance of partnerships in terms of delivering financial services. Well, there are journalists in the room who are all looking for headlines for tomorrow's papers and the lead stories this evening. If you could sum up uh, this conversation and uh, give them a headline to run with uh, tomorrow, Herman, what would that be? <laughs> I'm always first. <laughs> uh, um, context matters. Context matters. That's the headline for tomorrow. Uh, Rose? Data will drive finance in Africa. Data will drive finance in Africa. And Paul? Design for the customer, but start now. Design for the customer and start now. I don't think I could have ended this conversation on a better note. A very big thank you uh, to my panelists. That is uh, Herman Schmidt, Rose Goslinger, and Paul Koehira. Uh, they've been a fantastic panel, of course. Our live audience here in Kigali, Rwanda, also contributing through questions, comments, uh, as well as their own insights into the conversation. We're coming to you live from the MasterCard Foundation Symposium on Financial Inclusion. I'm Nozi Pumbandra, and for now, it's Goodbye.